But Peter says, listen, you don't need to be afraid of Satan because you are a child of God. That's why he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Be sober, be vigilant because the, your adversary, the devil, walks like a roaring lion, roaring lion, roaring lion. Remember that. Seeking whom he may devour. But I'm telling you, Peter saying, but I'm telling you, because of the work of Jesus Christ, you can resist him. No matter what happens, we are wrapping up first Peter. Because as promised, we are beginning... Genesis next Wednesday and we will not we will not be taking a break until um, there's a week in October that I will not be available uh, around the 16th the 18th so I'll let you know with plenty of time um, so they so we will not take a break now in September I'll take one in October and then the holidays come very quickly and you know, Thanksgiving and then Christmas will be two weeks. So we'll work all of that out. But uh, we are starting Genesis next Wednesday. And I'm looking forward to that. Remember, on Sunday mornings, we're going to jump into First and Second Timothy. First and Second Timothy. Hey, good evening. Um, starting as soon as we get done through the book of Revelation. A couple more weeks. Um, we have a couple of exciting uh, updates for you today. Um, Miss Betty um, seems to be handling everything really well. She did chemo yesterday, and uh, she told Kathy, go to church, get out. There'll be days I won't feel well, and I need you to stay, but today uh, she said go to church, so we're excited that she felt that strong. Also, Jose's back from his stay in the hospital. So we have a lot to be thankful for. And then the third one, I'm going to let them share it themselves. Sal and Karina have an announcement to make. So I want them to come up and share it. Or um, Sal, come on up. Come over here. So because that way it's on, right? Yes. Yes. So they want, they want to see you. All right. Uh, very quickly, so um, last in last two weeks, two weeks ago, um, I the, the lawyers told me that I could call them to make an expedited request for the work permit, um, and I called them and I told them the reasons why we needed this expedite because it's been six months since um, I had to stop working, um, and um, we didn't hear anything for the last two weeks up until last night yesterday right it was last night when um, I looked into the status and it said that the expedited request was approved <laughs> what that means is that instead of being on, on line number 20 my number it went up to the first ones so they, they were gonna check my work permit um, soon and um, that was last night so this morning when I woke up I look at, um, and check into the um, the system to see what the status is, and uh, my work permit has been approved. So, praise the Lord. All the glory goes to Him. And I want to thank everyone in this class and everyone that has been praying for us. Thank you for your prayers. We still need more. Um, this is one step forward. Um, this is one step that we've been waiting for. Um, all the glory goes to him. Uh, the green card is still in process. We need to wait until we um, become current. Um, hopefully, uh, next month it can get updated and more visas will be available. Uh, we will wait for the next month to see what it says. But for now, the work permit has been approved. I can come back to work. I'm going to tell my employees, my employer. Uh, that I can, that I'm, that has been approved. But thank you, everyone, for your prayers. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, that is the update. Amen. Yeah. I, I, we are, we are ecstatic over that. 
situation. God has been really blessing them. They made a very radical decision over the last couple of weeks to take in a little girl who was struggling from Colombia. And they made a risky, radical move, and she moves in with them in December, December 5th, 4th. Yeah, So they're taking her in, and God, in return, has blessed and answered a prayer that we were thought it would take much longer. So he can return to work, and then the other stuff will come. So God is good. He's showing himself. So what a great, great night of, of positive announcements. It's good to see everybody tonight. Um, we're wrapping up, Peter. This is. Uh, hey, yes, thing? please. Now that it's kind of public, um, we all know my daughter and Aaron and my son-in-law Todd, and we have good news. Aaron is pregnant. Yes. Oh. That's a girl. That's a girl. Wow. A girl. That that is great. For those of you who don't know, about a year and a half now. A, a year in May, a year ago in May, um, they lost their granddaughter, um, and it was a very difficult time. Um, but now, with all the things happening, and for her to be pregnant again, and with a girl, it's that's uh, that's very powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I can't imagine how over the moon you guys are. So we'll be praying. So join me as we pray. Um, we have a lot to be thankful for, and, and, and that's, that's a great, great reports we've gotten. Father, we, we come before you, and we thank you for all that we have just been witness of and how great and mighty you are to take situations that are difficult and hard to fathom and hard to deal with, but you just plow the field and, and just show your hand. Um, Father, we, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to, to get these testimonies, to listen, um, to hear what you're doing in the lives of your children. We thank you tonight that Marty and Deb are going to celebrate the, um, the birth of a grand girl granddaughter super soon and miss betty is is really handling the chemo so well and jose is is here tonight as a testimony to his love for you and and just the fact that you've gotten him out of the hospital just the other night and he here he is back and then sal and karina this wonderful testimony that he has gotten his work visa and he's able to go back to work and and um, that puts him in such a a great situation and we just pray for this daughter that they're going to adopt in the next few months that you would just move in a mighty way and take out every obstacle father so this can be a um, completed thing we thank you for their lives we thank you for their testimony we thank you for the ministry that they have to this group on Wednesdays and on Sundays to put this video out to put this out on on the air for people to see I have people approach me that I don't even know, say, ah, I saw you on the video, and I'm like, that's because of Sal and Karina and their efforts and their work. So thank you, Father, for all that, that they mean to me and to the church, and we just give you all the honor and the glory. And now as we open your word, Father, we pray that you would speak to us. As always, we pray that you would saturate this campus with your Holy Spirit, that he would have his way in every classroom, in every group setting that we have tonight, that he would move in a powerful way. We thank you for all that you're doing, and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And I'm going to read a few verses. Though our goal is to get through most of this, um, there will be nothing left hanging. So we're going to move quickly. Um, buckle your seatbelts. Yes, please. Hey there, Lamari. Come on in. 
There are, uh, you, you want to sit here? There's a chair right there. You can sit right there. There's one here, too. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. So we're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to be talking about exhortations and explanations. Exhortations and explanations. Well, what? What about what? Concerning suffering. Remember that over the last few chapters, Peter has been stressing to his readers the importance of the fact that we must be uh, in submission to all the things that God has for us. And as he is teaching us to be submissive to different aspects of our lives, he's also teaching us that Christ was our example. And as our example, that he suffered, and he then shares with us the suffering of Christ and our suffering. And we talked quite a bit about suffering, and now he's going to tie the bow as he closes his letter. And just to, to amplify the idea behind what Peter is trying to teach us, he uses the word suffering 21 times in this letter. So when you, when you consider uh, that he uses it in just five chapters, 21 times, more than the Gospels combined, we get to see, um, and we take a natural look at, the persecution. So let's read. We're in verse 12, chapter 4, verse 12, 1 Peter. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, as a busybody. Uh oh, as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. I'll stop right there. We're going to get through this and then into chapter 5. So he's going to give us the answer. And verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. It is natural to look at persecution, to look at trials, to look at suffering, and to respond as if it were something strange and abnormal and unique. Peter is reminding us that suffering is a part of the package. Now, this is Wednesday night, so I could share a little bit deeper than, than most of the time. But this is not for your uh, milk-drinking Christians. Because Peter reminds us that suffering is it's what it's about. It's not strange. It's not um, strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you. Now, please note some of the language here. 
It doesn't say, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which may try you. Uh, He is reminding us, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. You can take it to the bank. You can be guaranteed that you are going to go through many trials and tribulations. Why? Because Christ went through them. And if Christ went through them, we are going to go through them. And um, the truth of the matter is, here's where it gets a little bit interesting, and I say this as often as I can, the closer you are to the front lines, the more you're sharing the love of Jesus, the more you are wrapped up in doing what God wants you to do, and you are in His will, you're doing You're in the front lines, whether it be at work, whether it be here, whether it be in your personal life, in your neighborhood. You are on the front lines sharing Jesus, letting people know that you are a believer and that you walk a certain walk, that you don't hide it. You're willing to show that you are a strong believer. When you do that and you're on the front lines, you have a huge target on you and the enemy sends his weaponry in your direction. So you are going to face persecution. And Peter reminds us that it is normal for a Christian to experience it. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Especially if you take a stand. I've said this before. Satan does not waste his ammunition on normal Christians. On nominal Christians. On those who are just warming a pew and doing nothing. And punching in on Sunday mornings. And punching out and being done. And and not wanting to let anybody know. And, And really they're closet Christians. And they don't want to let anybody know. But when you are willing to carry the banner of Jesus Christ, he turns his big guns on those who are storming the gates of hell. Because that's what we're doing. Every time we lift up the name of Jesus, every time we find ourselves sharing Jesus without fear, sharing Jesus and letting, inviting people to church and doing all the things that we get wrapped up in, I'm telling you that it just invites persecution from the enemy. Verse 13 says, But rejoice! If you've been with me for a while in my teaching, you know that's my favorite word in the Bible. But. But. It's my favorite word. Because he's reminding us, yes, you're going to have persecution. Yes, you're going to have suffering. Yes, don't count it strange. Consider it. Know that it's going to happen. And then he says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. This privilege should cause great rejoicing. In essence, You get a report, like Miss Kathy got about her mom. You get a report, like I've been dealing with with for almost a year with my wife. And there are times, not always, I'm human, but there are times that I walk out of my house rejoicing. And it's, I don't almost, sometimes I don't figure it out. But I know that I know that God's got a plan. I, I what what's the plan? Why is she down and why is this all happening? I don't know. But I know that I know that I know for the 47 years I've been doing this um as a child of God, I know that he always comes through and he never fails. So those who suffer for him will be honored when he returns. Those who suffer for him will be honored. And it's, it's so perfect because on Sunday mornings, as you know, we're studying, 
Revelation and we're in Revelation 20 and we're talking about the millennial reign and we're talking about all these things that are going to happen at the end of time when it all ends how's it going to happen and we're right at that point of the millennial reign and I left everybody hanging on Sunday with some controversy and I'm ready for this Sunday um, I'm expecting a ton of questions someone asked somebody said they were going to text me some questions I haven't gotten the text yet but it's a lot of questions but those who suffer for him here will be honored when he returns. We will be given a special status, a special privilege, a special honor that we will get when he returns. So verse 14 says, If you are reproached in the name, for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and God and of God rests upon you. His Holy Spirit, who rests in us, who lives in us, also rests on us. I am a student of the Word, and I truly believe that there is a special anointing that comes upon you when God assigns you a special task. Now, please understand, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but we got to do this. When we are all filled with the Holy Spirit, the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. We get all of Him. It's not a little dab. There is not, um, there is not a secondary baptism of the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit the moment we get saved. However, but, there is an anointing that can come upon those that God has a special assignment for. And I believe sometimes our special assignment is to walk through the valley and go through a difficult situation and God will give us an extra added dose of His Holy Spirit and His Holy Spirit will come upon us. He's in us, but He will come upon us in the form of an anointing. Because it is important that we understand when these things happen. Now, Bobby, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Well, verse 15 tells me, verse 14 tells me clearly, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the Spirit of Glory, capital S, and of God, Spirit of glory and of God, same spirit, rests upon you. Rests upon you. If the spirit is already in you, then there must be a separate and above and beyond anointing that comes to those who have a special assignment given to them by God. And that assignment may just be dealing with a waiting room or dealing with a hospital surgical room or dealing with neighbors, whatever it may be, God will then send his Holy Spirit and he will rest on you so that you have his anointing so that you can go through what you're about to face. He doesn't leave you out there by yourself. He gives you a special anointing. So, you should be thankful if you are reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Verse 15. Ah, we haven't finished 14. Blessed are you for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. On their part. The world. Why are you going through this? Why? Kind of like the story of Job. Why don't you just curse God and die? That's what they told Job. Why don't you just curse God and die? You, you, you've been so loyal to God. And now look what's happened to you. And look all the things that have happened to you. And all the loss that you've suffered. Why don't you just curse God and die? And that's what the world will tell us. Why do, you, why do you even bother going to church? 
Why, why, do you, why, why, why are you wasting your time? The end of verse 14 says, On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he, Christ, is glorified. The anointing of God comes on the child of God. Again, the Spirit of God lives in us. The anointing of God comes upon us to help us walk through or do what God has assigned us to do, whatever that task may be, you pray for his anointing, God, the Spirit comes upon you, and then you complete the task, you do what God has, has assigned to you, and all of a sudden, he is glorified. Christ is glorified. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit upon us is so that Christ can be glorified. Peter was right on. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Now this is a little bit of a Peter. Peter's gotten us into some quandaries here. A Christian should never bring suffering upon himself for wrongdoing. That's what Peter's saying here. Peter's saying here, listen, if you're suffering because you're a murderer, if you're suffering because you're a thief, if you're suffering because you're an evildoer or a busybody in other people's matters, then your suffering, it's on you. It's on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. A Christian should never bring suffering upon himself for wrongdoing. There is no glory for God in this. Only shame for the testimony of Christ. You know my story. My dad was a chaplain in some of the worst prisons. And I used to hear all the stories. And I believe that God will take someone who may have committed a heinous crime or may have done something and his power moves in a, in a very strong way and people are saved in prison and come out and are radically changed. I, I believe that can happen. But do you understand how bad it is for, and we see it all the time, church leaders, church pastors, church associate pastors, who are being arrested for child molestation, who are being arrested for having, you know, cra crazy things happening in their life. We see it all the time. And, and it really does do a lot of damage to the kingdom of God because the world immediately points the finger and say, you see, they're all like that. How many times have you heard that Christians be called hypocrites? Because we're all like that. But that's what Peter is saying. Don't, you, listen, don't pat yourself on the back for doing something wrong. Don't, don't gloat about doing something wrong. You have to be mindful that doing something wrong brings no honor to God. And by the way, I find it quite interesting. I don't know about you, but I find it quite interesting that Peter says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Pretty harsh. A thief. Steal somebody else's belongings, pretty hard. An evildoer, which so it encompasses all things that are evil, which means you're doing harm to another human being. Those things are, are horrible. Murder, thief, evildoer, all harmful to other people. And then he mixes in there, just kind of throws it in. And as a busybody... In other people's matters. Murder. Being a thief. Being an evildoer. And being a busybody. And let me tell you from being in church as many years as I have. That probably does more damage than all the others. Because we may not murder anybody. We may not steal from anybody. We may not even do evil. But we are often guilty of being a busybody in other people's matters. Somebody knocks on your door or calls you and, 
Oh, God bless you. How are you doing? You doing okay? Did you hear about... <laughs> Did you hear about... And they cover it up under a Christian phone call. Did you hear about... Listen. Listen. Gossip is a church destroyer. And Peter is saying it. Don't be a busybody in other people's matters. I, I'm going to stop right there because I think that's enough said. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, if anyone suffers for doing what is right, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. There is no disgrace in suffering as a believer. As a believer, it is possible to glorify God in all trials. For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. Now, I won't lie to you when I tell you that I wrote myself a big note with multiple asterisks here because this verse is often misused. Now, I will tell you that it is, it can apply for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. So, he's contrasting here persecution of the church versus the judgment to come. And he is reminding us that as believers, we are going to be held at a higher standard. Driving down 436, and you're going 70 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, as you're driving, you see the red flashing lights, and then the horn, whoop, 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 pull over, whatever, and they pull you over, and you pull into the KFC across the street, and you wait there, and he comes to the window. And says, do you realize you were doing 70 or 60? And your response is, but officer, I didn't know the speed limit. <laughs> oh, okay. You didn't know the speed limit? It's okay. It's 45, but you didn't know it. So, you're good. You didn't know. I'll let you go. Unfortunately, I know as, as, as crazy as that may sound, there are a lot of church folk that use the term, I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that. Oh, I didn't know. Listen, what Peter is reminding us of is that judgment begins in the Lord's house. There is a higher level of accountability for people who are spending time and calling themselves Christians than there is for someone who has never darkened the doorstep of a church. And as difficult as that may sound, what Peter is trying to remind us is you're not going to get away with it. Judgment is coming. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then he quotes from Proverbs 11.31. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, 
then where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? And then he says, therefore, remember what I tell you. When you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself, what's it there for? And Peter is making his final point to this. He says, therefore, let us, let those who suffer according to the will of God, commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Here's what Peter is saying. Doing what is right pays. Doing what is right pays. Now I will warn you that oftentimes when we live as Christians, doing what is right is usually the more difficult path. If you think you can get away with always taking shortcuts, I promise you in the Christian walk, it is not what God has for you. When, when you're a contra- okay, what a God, what do you want me to do? And you see two paths in front of you, and they both seem to be blessed, but one has just smells like roses and everything's going good and there's no issues. And every time you, you go in that direction, it just you seem to, to prosper. Let me tell you something, that's how the enemy operates. Yeah. He wants to make you think that that's the best way. And how can you tell the difference? Because one will satisfy the flesh. One will make you feel good. And can I tell you, there is one that's not going to be as easy. That one that's not going to be satisfying to the flesh. Wednesday nights, you get home, you worked all day. And then you're reminded, oh, it's Wednesday. I, I got to go to church. And your flesh tells you, ah, just stay home. Just, I, I'll watch it online. They won't miss me. It, it's, it's, it'll be okay. It's not a big deal. And your flesh will always tell you. But your spirit will say, no, 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 you got to go. You, you, you got to go. And yes, I know you can watch it online, but there's nothing like being here and experiencing it firsthand. So what Peter is closing this chapter saying, doing what, what is right will be what pays off. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. The elders who are among you, I exhort you. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those who, in, who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will not fade away. Now, remember who the author is. Because this is a perfect time to remind you that Peter was crazy. <laughs> Peter was, was crazy. He, he did everything to the extreme. There was no... A little... He just did everything with a full passion... But it caused him to be a little crazy. He sees Jesus walking on water. He said, let me go. Let me walk with you. Now, there's a lot of boldness, but there's a lot of craziness. They come to arrest Jesus. Well, even before that, 
when 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 he says, okay, it's time, and and they're preparing for what is to be the last supper, and then the first holy communion during that Thursday night um, event, he wants to start it by washing the feet of the disciples, and he grabs a towel and puts it on his belt and he gets on his knees and and begins to do this and he gets to Peter and Peter said no I'm not going to let you wash my feet now I don't believe Peter was the first one so he's washing all these other people's feet and Peter he, he goes I ain't, I'm not one of these idiots that's that's my paraphrase yeah. that's not in the NIV that's just Bob's version I'm not one of these guys. I'm not one of these losers. No, you're not going to wash my feet. No, you're not going to wash my feet. He says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have any part with me. And Peter says, oh, okay, then wash all of me. <laughs> wash all of me. This is the same Peter that when he would, they were asked, who do the people say that I am? And they said, oh, some say you're Elijah, and some say you're John the Baptist. But who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, you're, you're absolutely right, and upon this rock I will build my church. Which is controversial. Peter's not the rock. Even though Peter, according to the Catholic Church, is the first pope. Peter was not the rock. The rock was his testimony that Jesus was the Christ. At one point, they're having a conversation, and he says, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Because he was just like, oh. Peter was wondering, who, the, who is the one that's going to deny you? I'm never going to deny you. I'm never going to let you down. Look at all what you've done for me. I'm never going to let you down. And he looks at Peter and says, Peter, before the sun rises in the morning and the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Now, what you talking about, Willis? That'll never happen. And Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and he tells Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, to come a little further. But please stay awake and watch for him. And he walks back down and they're sleeping. Peter, one of them. Fast forward, they get to the garden and Judas had pointed out who Jesus was and betrays him. Kisses him on the cheek. And they ask, the soldiers ask, we're looking for Jesus. Are you him? And he says, I am. And they all pass out. Then they get back up. And Peter says, I'm not going to take this lying down. And he pulls out his sword. And I don't know how it happens. But Malchus, one of the soldiers, gets his ears chopped off. So I don't quite <laughs> never understood how his head wasn't chopped off. But Peter was... A fisherman. He wasn't a fighter. <laughs> but then they arrest Jesus. And Peter is curious enough to follow just far enough behind. And Peter is recognized. But weren't you with him? And Peter says, no, you, you're, you're mistaken. Second person. Yeah. You look familiar. I would hear him preach and you were there standing right next to him or somebody might have said, again, this is my biblical spiritual imagination. I remember one day we were hungry sitting listening to him preach and, and you handed me some bread that he prayed for and some fish that he prayed for and you handed it to me. I know you're with him. He goes, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And the Bible says he cursed. He said, no, you don't know any, you know, can you imagine? And he cursed at him. And then he goes and gets a little closer to the palace where they were trying him. And he's warming his hands, trying to act like a regular person. And a little girl says, oh, yeah, you're definitely one of them. I've seen you with him. 
and he curses at her and tells her, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just a little girl. And as, as, I, as I picture that encounter with the little girl, I see Jesus in my spiritual imagination being escorted out of the palace into the presence of Pilate. And at that very moment, around 5.30, 6 a.m., the sun begins to peak and the rooster crows. And Jesus glances over because he's Jesus. And he knows that what he had prophesied had just come to pass. And he looks over in my, again, sanctified imagination. He looks over at Peter over his shoulder and just shakes his head. And Peter looks at the master from a distance and just puts his head down and runs out. Sunday morning comes. And Mary Magdalene comes running to where the disciples are in the upper room. They had been there when they celebrated the, the Passover on Thursday uh, and the Lord's Supper and all the things that had happened. Now they're hiding out in the upper room and Mary Magdalene comes running and says, you're not going to believe this. He's alive. And Peter, who had gone running the night he was arrested there is no evidence that Peter was at the cross. There is no evidence that he witnessed the crucifixion. There is no evidence that he got anywhere near that. He locked himself in that room and cried for two and a half days. And then Mary comes with a testimony and says, he's alive. And the Bible says, that him and John went running. And the Gospel of John, because he's telling himself the story, says that I outran Peter. That's what he says. He says, I ran faster. I was younger. I'm, I, I ran faster than Peter did. And he gets, the Bible says, he gets to the place where the stone had been rolled away. John does. And he looks in. Peter is right behind him and he doesn't look in. He just goes right in. And he sees two angels sitting where the body of Christ was. The cloth that had wrapped up the body of Christ was there. I would have to imagine the blood was on the stone and the two angels said to Peter, why are you looking amongst the dead for the living? And Peter is overwhelmed and overjoyed. And later that night, Jesus walks into the room where they are. And Peter is overjoyed. But it hadn't been resolved yet. Next couple of days, as Jesus continues to show up, they had gone fishing. And Jesus was at the shore cooking some fish. And the Bible says Peter didn't even wait for the boat to get to the shore. He knew it was Jesus. And he jumps out and swims to where Jesus is. And Jesus looks at him. This is what this says here. Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, do you love me? He goes, you know I love you. He says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you, you know that I love you. Then he asks him the third time. Three denials. Three questions. He says, do you love me? Feed 
my sheep. Peter walks away, probably questioning all that had taken place. Forty days later, he witnesses as Jesus rises up and leaves them. And there's so much going on that he doesn't understand everything that's taking place. He's still confused. I denied him. He asked me if I loved him. What am I supposed to do? There was some clarity, but not total clarity. And he goes back to the place where all of this had transpired into the upper room where he was asked to wait. And all of a sudden, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God who had come to live inside the believer comes upon Peter and upon those 70 that were in the upper room. And all of a sudden, Peter is a new man. And Peter goes on to be the great Preacher, that day he preaches and over 5,000 were saved. Peter and John were walking in a few weeks later into the temple area on that Saturday afternoon and there's a beggar on the side and he's asking, alms, alms, I'm begging you, please give me some money. And Peter and John look at him and Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus get up and walk. That's what Peter had become. So much so that you know the story. History tells us that when it came time for Peter to be martyred, to be killed, they said, you're going to be crucified. And he didn't want anything to do with being crucified like his Savior. And he said, if you're going to crucify me, crucify me upside down. The anguish of the crucifixion is unbelievable, but to be crucified upside down is incredible. Now, listen to the words of that Peter I just described to you. The elders who are among you, I exhort you. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. I've suffered, he says. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not, for, not as being lords over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, Christ himself appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. There's that idea of submission. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him. For he, Christ, cares for you. Verse 8 then says, be sober and vigilant. Sober means serious minded. Vigilant means prepared. Be sober and be vigilant because the adversary, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, he may perfect, he may establish, he may strengthen, and he may settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever and ever. Amen. Verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion Seeking whom he may devour. 
The good news is he doesn't devour everyone. Why? Because he can't. He cannot devour a child of God. We are Teflon to him. We are a live wire. And if he tries to attack us, he has Jesus to deal with. So he can't devour everyone. If you've seen me talk about this passage, I'm going to share this and, and close with this. The problem is that he is still a roaring lion. And one of the things I've learned, and I've heard this story many times, that a lion's roar at the peak or the prime of its life can carry for miles. And that's why he is known as, the lion is, the king of the jungle. Because of its vicious nature, but more because of the mighty roar. But as that lion gets older, he begins to lose his agility. He begins to lose his claws and his teeth because he's old. But he still has that mighty roar. And the younger lions and lionesses who are growing into their claws and growing into their teeth are not growing into their roar. So they come up with this amazing plan. And they set up the old lion on one side of the pathway hiding behind the bushes and they hide on the other side of the road behind a different set of bushes and they tell the old lion with the mighty roar exactly what to do and when the deer or the antelope or any animal that they find delicious which is mostly everything, <laughs> walks through the pathway, unbeknownst to them that there are lions in the area, this older lion gets out of the bushes and lets out that mighty roar. Doesn't have to move, doesn't have to get up, just stretches there and pokes his head out and just does what they've asked him to do and lets out a mighty roar. And what happens to that bait, to that animal, is he, by nature, runs in the opposite direction. And he runs into the paws and to the teeth of these young lions who knew that the sound of the mighty roar would cause the prey to run in the opposite direction. Ladies and gentlemen, when Christ said it is finished, there are so many layers of what happened that we could be here for weeks. But one of the things that happened is that Satan was declawed. And he lost his teeth. And he lost his agility and he lost his power. Now he still has this mighty roar. And he can scare you to run into the opposite direction. But Peter says, listen, you don't need to be afraid of Satan because you are a child of God. That's why he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Be sober, be vigilant, because the, your adversary the devil walks like a roaring lion, roaring lion, roaring lion. Remember that. 
seeking whom he may devour. But I'm telling you, Peter saying, but I'm telling you, because of the work of Jesus Christ, you can resist him. You can resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, to him be the glory. So he says, listen, you resist him, and you stand fast, and you face him, and you let him know I am a child of the Most High God. And the Most High God's for me. I'm a child of the Most High God. And the Most High God's for me. I'm a child of the Most High God. And the Most High God's for me. You put one foot in front of the other. And say, not today, Satan. <laughs> not today, devil. Not today. And in the name of Jesus, a name that is above all names, a name that when it was pronounced during the days of Scripture, the demons trembled. It is finished, he said. Satan has been defeated. His teeth, no more. His claws, no more. Yes, he still has a mighty roar. But he's been beaten. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. That's how he closes this letter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to really delve into this wonderful book of 1 Peter. And as I've shared with this group tonight, I'm so thankful for his, his craziness. Because in it, we've learned so much. And in his willingness to be frank and honest and sincere, we see, we see what it is we need to do. And Father, we ask you tonight that we would stand firm and resist the devil and know that I'm a child of the Most High God and the Most High God's for me. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this lesson. And we continue to pray that you would be with us and bless us. Bring us back on Sunday so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you. We pray that you would get us home safely. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, and everyone said.